Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 105, March 20th to March 26th, 1863. Last week, we stopped in to see what is going on in Southern Virginia with Longstreet's operations, as well as some action in North Carolina. While New Bern has not been retaken, there was a valuable amount of supplies that were captured by the Confederates. It's actually going to be the general theme of Longstreet's operations and the subsequent operations in North Carolina, in that there's going to be a gathering of supplies that are going to allow for further offensive action for the Army of Northern Virginia. To round out last week, we introduced a couple more figures. I think this may be something I will continue to do every now and then, with a lighter weeks especially. This week we are going to spend most of our time in Tennessee, before stopping in briefly in Florida, which I know is sort of a rarity. To start off though, let's go ahead and check in with a not-so-stellar performance by John Hunt Morgan. Before we get into that, there is a announcement for the Patreon. Of course, it's the same announcement I had last week, and that is that we had a Patreon episode that was posted, and this one is going to be a memoir review for John Singleton Mosby. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, learn a little bit more about Mosby and see what I thought about the memoir and whether that's going to be worth your time for a read or a listen, uh, that is posted to the Patreon feed. And we're actually right around the corner from having another Patreon episode, and this time we're going to go back to a movie review. We might be actually a little movie heavy here in the next few months, but I think it ties very well into our narrative episodes. And this time we're going to be doing The Horse Soldiers, and that's going to be a John Wayne movie. And the reason being is that we're coming up on Gerson's raid into uh, Mississippi, and uh, that is loosely based on those events the the movie is uh maybe not uh in a really good way but that's at least supposed to be the inspiration behind that uh so we will be giving that a watch and you know i don't think we've actually done uh, a john wayne movie yet we certainly did an errol flynn movie uh earlier here so uh, it would be good to have some of these classic actors represented in some of the movies here so John Wayne, William Holden uh, are both in that movie. John Ford also directed, so it is packing a little bit of a punch there. And uh, we'll see what we think about that and how we think it fits in to our story here. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, then that is going to be posted here next month very soon on the Patreon feed, so stay tuned for that. So remember, we talked about Thompson Station in the Union probing attempt at the Confederates under Bragg. That had not worked out well for the Union, which may have added to the reluctance of Rosecrans to get moving at the beginning of the campaign season as it reared its head. Well, both sides needed to gather information, but for Rosecrans, he was looking to solve the issue of facing unknown enemy forces. You see, in the West, the Union Army had the same issue as in the East mainly that their cavalry forces were not on the same level as the rebels. A great example is Nathan Bedford Forrest and his most recent raids to disrupt the operations of Ulysses Grant in concert with Earl Van Dorn. If you recall, Braxton Bragg was looking to kill two birds with one stone by offering token support to Pemberton and Vicksburg, but also getting rid of Forrest. Forrest had rode with ill-equipped and inexperienced men, and yet he had given the Federal Cavalry a tough time. The Army of the Cumberland already had an advantage in numbers, so now they needed to close the gap in terms of cavalry. Basil Duke would write about Rosecrans and his efforts. Rosecrans was determined to make his superior numbers tell, at least in the immediate vicinity of his army. 
he inaugurated a system about this time which resulted in the decided improvement of his cavalry. He would send out a body of cavalry, stronger than anything it was likely to encounter, and that it might never be demoralized by a complete whipping. He would back in with an infantry force, never far in the rear, and always ready to finish the fight which the cavalry began. This method benefited the latter greatly. We know that Rosecrans has a numerical advantage, especially with his army concentrated in the relative vicinity of Nashville. And we also know that in the winter, the Confederate forces are going to have to spread out fairly far in order to obtain a good amount of forage for men and animals alike. So it is logical that Rosecrans is going to use that to his advantage. Not all of Rosecrans's ideas are going to be bad, and I know sometimes he gets a bad rap for how his career sort of ends when we get into Chickamauga, and that is a disaster, obviously, for the Federal Army, but he does have some pretty good tactical ideas, and we'll probably get into it in a future episode, but he thinks that there needs to be an emphasis on weapons that can be rapid fire and he's not necessarily wrong there and he thinks he can close the gap in terms of the advantage that the confederates have in cavalry he thinks he can close that if he has mounted infantry so that's how he's going to uh, try to combat that in march of 1863 the action at thompson station near franklin was just one probe on the flank Colonel Albert Hall of the 105th Ohio would lead a probe to the other flank, this time meeting with Morgan's cavalry. We know that Morgan occupies one flank and Forrest uh, relatively occupies the other. Morgan had somewhere between 2,000 and 3,500 men, some of which would make contact with the probing force on the 19th. This was fairly heavy skirmishing near Liberty, Tennessee, involving 200 or some rebels. Faced with pressure from the Confederates, Hall would withdraw and search for a good defensive position. Morgan would pursue the Federals. Hall would draw up his men at a position known as Vaught's Hill. With this high ground, the Union force, although outnumbered, did have an advantage, especially against cavalry. Maybe thinking about Forrest and Van Dorr's success earlier in the month, or perhaps even thinking of his earlier success against the Federals in the winter, where he had taken on a Green Infantry Brigade and beaten them, Morgan decided that he would assault the Yankees. This did not go over well, the Northern forces beating back his attacks. Along with the 105th, there was also good service done by the 80th and 123rd Illinois, as well as the 101st Indiana. Hall would also have a battery of Indiana artillery. Given these regiments and his battery, He decided to go with a perimeter defense, meaning he would cover all his flanks and rear. This was a good idea because Morgan had resorted to almost fully enveloping his enemy, so the Federals were hit on multiple sides. Talked about Thompson Station, how the Confederates worked their way in behind the Union Brigade of Infantry, so that's uh, essentially going to cut that off from happening again. Heavy charges were met with volleys from the determined enemy. We have some eyewitness accounts of the action, one from a corporal in the 105th Ohio. Colonel Hall, seeing his ammunition run low, concluded to try the effect of a little stratagem upon the wily Morgan. He sent his orderlies to the rear amongst the teamsters, ordering them to remount every mule and horse, get them in column, and ride in from the rear upon a gallop, cheering with all their might. The thing was nicely done. In came the doughty teamsters, yelling at the loudest key of their brazen throats. The infantry, supposing reinforcements had really arrived, joined in the chorus. The artillery fired with more vigor, and with all combined, the most unearthly din was created that caused consternation in the ranks of the fighting rebels. Panic seized upon them, and men, who but a moment before were fighting so severely, skedaddled like sheep. Another first-hand account would read, We have been in another battle, which was about as hot as Perryville. 
We fought the rebels at Milton from 9 o'clock until about 1 or 2 o'clock. They had about 3 men to our 1, but we whipped them bad. It's telling that the writers considered the fighting fiercer than Perryville, speaking to the ferocity of the battle. Perryville is often listed as, pound for pound, some of the most desperate fighting of the war. As the accounts lay out, the fighting ended in the afternoon. Morgan was concerned at the potential for Union reinforcements arriving from Murfreesboro. Cavalry was on its way to aid their comrades, so the raider decided to call off any further efforts and withdraw. At the conclusion of the battle, there were around 300-some casualties on the Confederate side, compared to 60 on the Union. This was a lopsided Union victory, especially once again compared to the action earlier this month. Morgan would withdraw into Kentucky in order to rest and resupply his men. This would be a positive note when compared to some setbacks that the Army of the Cumberland was seeing already in March of 1863. Speaking of setbacks, we need to talk about Brentwood, action occurring on the 25th of March, also in Tennessee. When we last talked about Forrest, he had helped to turn the tables on the Federals at Thompson Station. Now, he was going to exploit the success. Brentwood was a depot on the Nashville and Decatur Railroad. It would, of course, be used as a supply depot for the Union Army. It's another thing about Rosecrans that... We'll see, especially as his campaigns start to roll out here in 1863, he puts a big emphasis on the use of the railroad and how that can be very nice in terms of supplying his army. So that is something to keep in mind as well. He's very much a general who's going to use these modern inventions and adaptations to his advantage. Now, Brentwood is north of Thompson Station and north of Franklin, making it only nine miles south of Nashville. March 24th would see Forrest begin his operation against Brentwood by sending a brigade of cavalry to cut off all communications from the strategic depot. Now, Brentwood was commanded by a Colonel Bloodgood and garrisoned by a regiment of Wisconsin infantry. Specifically, this was probably 800 or so men of the 22nd Wisconsin. This unit was known as the Abolition Regiment, so you could imagine it was a particularly soft target for someone like Forrest. This command was split between the depot itself as well as a stockade. Forrest would pressure the depot on the 25th, which would evolve into skirmishing. Briefly, the Federals would offer resistance to the Confederate cavalry. The deployment of artillery, though, would make things even hairier for the garrison. Forrest would demand the capitulation of the town, and it was actually refused initially. Once Bloodgood realized that he was surrounded, he would surrender to Forrest. Likewise, Forrest would demand the surrender of the stockade, which was given. This is a great example of the reputation and the tactics we have already mentioned as being employed by the Confederate Cavalry General. Reputation is going to lead to the surrender of garrisons who would otherwise not do so. Of course, this is not going to be the case at Fort Pillow in 64, but we're going to get there. Brentwood is in a position where, if there was to be a resistance, it could be another attack like Dover. Confederate cavalry would suffer heavier casualties, and Union reinforcements could potentially arrive in time to save the garrison and drive off the rebels. Look at what just happened at Vaught's Hill. Morgan's men could not make headway on a strong defensive position. Forrest, of course, does not want to involve his command with costly assaults. His goal is to disrupt, and he often employs bluffs when speaking and negotiating with the enemy. Of course, his record is going to precede him in these, and he is probably helped by his hot temperament and his large frame. It's one of the things that is interesting about Forrest is that he is very unorthodox when it comes to war. There are other, even contemporary sources that would point that out, but this is going to make him both an asset and a liability because he's going to be able to operate effectively as an independent commander 
And certainly if you give him a lot of free reign, he's going to be able to do a lot with it. However, if you put him in a conventional army where there are conventional practices and roles that the cavalry needs to play, then he's not going to be as effective. And we're going to see that here later in the year. Following the capture of the 800-man garrison, Forrest would set about collecting the stores of the Federals. Despite having cut off communications, there was still a pursuit mounted by Northern Cavalry. Because of this pursuit, the rebels were forced to burn the captured supplies and escape with light skirmishing back to friendly lines. Casualty figures are pretty much all over the place from the sources I've seen. Obviously, these numbers are inflated by the number of prisoners taken by the rebels. I've seen that there were also some men captured as a result of the Federal Cavalry's pursuit following the raid, but I think in total it would of course be less than the losses of the North. On the 27th, we have skirmishing at Palatka, Florida. We have paid little attention to Florida, other than mentioning that at 140,000, it was the least populated southern state, providing only 15,000 men to the war effort as a whole. So given that figure, it might be surprising to know that there is a continued Union naval and ground presence in the state. What Florida could not provide in manpower, it could provide in supplies. Cattle and crops could be sent toward the rebel war effort. Overall, though, there would be little in terms of major battles in the state, minus one larger-scale battle in 1864, which we will certainly cover. Palatka, though, is a town a little south of Jacksonville, so northern Florida just for reference. Already there had been forays down the St. John River on the part of the U.S. Navy. And Palatka is on the St. John's River, so that gives you an idea we're still continuing operations in that area. We have maybe mentioned that there were joint naval and infantry operations in Florida, either to raid or simply make life uncomfortable for the Confederate Army or the populace. Now this would certainly be a situation where there's going to be a lot of irregular forces protecting Florida, so there are other states that are going to fall under that category. If you recall our very brief talk about the action at Tampa, you will recall some skirmishing, followed by a Confederate withdrawal, and then lack of real occupation by the attacking Union forces. Something similar had happened with Jacksonville, with these naval operations on the St. John's River. There's not really going to be a real reason for the Union Army to occupy the state fully. You know, there might be some actions that occur, there might be some probing that occurs, uh, but... It's just going to be consuming of resources that could be going elsewhere. Remember that Fort Pickens was still controlled by the U.S. forces, and had been along with Fort Sumter, even all the way back in 1861. For our action in 1863, we have a first-hand account of the skirmish. I advanced the command at a double-quick, through the open woods, to the beach and opened on the enemy with Maynard rifles, at a distance of about 300 yards. The enemy replied with shell and grape from a howitzer they had mounted on the prize and with musketry. After a spirited engagement, which was maintained for an hour and ten minutes, the enemy abandoned the prize and succeeded in making their escape in small boats, having previously fired the schooner to prevent its falling into our possession. Just as a quick note, this isn't part of the quote here. This is me talking that this is action that is going to be occurring over a rebel ship, you know, potentially a blockade runner. Uh, that's, so that's what they're talking about in terms of the prize. The loss of the enemy in this engagement, it is not possible to determine accurately. When the action commenced, from 24 to 28 men were counted on the deck of the schooner, and at its termination, not more than 9 to 12 were seen to escape in the boats. Many were seen to fall while an action was in progress. On our side, not a man was hurt. The enemy fled precipitately, leaving behind their flag, which, though Sergeant Strickland of Company G, 2nd Florida Cavalry, whose gallantry in rescuing it from the burning vessel I would desire and in a special manner to commend, fell into our possession. I cannot too highly extol the coolness and bravery displayed by the troops under my command on this occasion. 
Without exception, they behaved with the greatest gallantry, evincing the utmost composure in the face of danger. Lieutenant Simmons of Company G, 2nd Florida Cavalry, I am indebted for valuable assistance and take pleasure in referring to the gallantry displayed by him throughout the engagement. Now this is a good example of the smaller scale battles we have mentioned occur in the least populated state of the Confederacy. We should note though that much like in other parts of the South, conscription and impressment were definitely things to worry about. Conveniently, Florida has all these swamps, and deserters could use these swamps to hide from the Confederacy, as would some formerly enslaved individuals. Generally, they would make things tough on the sympathizers, as well as the Confederate Army, especially toward the end of the war. Something else I want to mention, you know, uh, it's something that we haven't really talked about too much, and this is definitely the kind of report that you would see uh, submitted, right? Or at least writing uh, about different individuals, and this is the kind of thing that you're going to use as an officer to make sure the individuals who uh, serve in a valiant manner get the proper recognition. And sometimes, you know, we talk about how, especially in the 1800s army, it's always, there's always this sort of air of how to do things properly, how not to do things properly. People get left off of reports or their roles get downplayed in reports. And it's all, you know, whether it's personal or maybe even political, there are definitely those motivations behind when those situations occur. But for the most part, this is a pretty good example of the kind of report that you would see, you know, after action, talking about the action and then talking about some individuals as well. So it's just a good thing to point out that these things are being written up a lot after even these smaller scale engagements. Finally, faced with pressure from all fronts and the campaign season certainly to begin soon, Jefferson Davis would call for fasting and prayer from the Confederate people. He would write, Through many conflicts we have now attained a place amongst nations which commands their respect, and let the enemies who encompass us around and seek our destruction see that the Lord of hosts has again taught them the lesson of his inspired word, that the battle is not to the strong, but whomever he willeth to exalt. Again, an enemy with loud boasting of power, of their armed men and mailed ships threaten us with subjugation and with evil machinations seek, even in our homes and at our own firesides, to pervert our men servants and our maid servants into accomplices of their wicked designs. It's an interesting insight into the attitude of Davis and the Confederacy. We have often talked about that there being a righteous war attitude amongst the Southerners, a second war of independence against the invaders, if you will. While food is being taken on to go toward the rebel war effort, though, fasting might be necessary. So if there's ever a time for prayer for the Southern cause, I suppose it was then in March of 1863. We have briefly mentioned Davis's tour of the West, something that Lincoln does not do during the war. Stopping at Pemberton's army and Bragg's, it's interesting whether he is really going to view things in a positive or negative lens. Both of those commanders are going to soon show that they are not the right guys for the job. Subordinates have already complained about both, and yet there are no changes made. So, it is interesting that there needs to be some prayer, some fasting, and some thanksgiving from the Confederacy when there could have been actionable items that could maybe have changed the course of how things are going. But it's also interesting, too, this doesn't necessarily sound like an overall positive message, right? At least, that's not how I'm interpreting it. It's more, there's a lot of things that are stacked against us, but it's not over kind of deal, right? So, it's not necessarily maybe what you want to hear if you're interested in how the war is going. And certainly, you're probably going to be feeling the strains of there not being as much food or supplies to go around, certainly. So that's also something negative. With that, we can go ahead and pause. This week, we had continued cavalry action in Tennessee. 
Morgan has had a setback, while Forrest has seen more success. We also talked about Florida and its role during the war, including a skirmish that would happen this week. We closed on some final thoughts about Jefferson Davis and the course of the war. Next week, we are going back to North Carolina, checking in with Richmond, and kicking off not one, but two campaigns. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.